Hi everyone, this lesson is on the condition known as tennis elbow, which is also known as lateral epicondylitis. So lateral epicondylitis is a condition involving the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, which is the bone of the upper arm. And you can see in this image, here is the humerus, this is the bone of the upper arm, and the humeral lateral epicondyle is where this condition occurs. And we're going to talk a bit more about this when we talk about the pathophysiology in the next slide. So some of the risk factors for getting this condition include repeated chronic use of the forearm, and physical deconditioning. Physical deconditioning is simply when being out of shape. Now this condition is known as tennis elbow because it can often be observed in tennis players but it can also be observed in other athletes that play racket sports including badminton and squash. Now there are three particular factors in playing these racket sports that can increase the likelihood of having tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis. One of them is going to be improper training. So Using the racket improperly or not being trained properly increases the risk of having this condition. Improper technique, especially with backhand, this can increase the likelihood of having this condition as well. And then improper equipment. If the racket is defective in some way, this can increase the likelihood of having this condition as well. Now, lateral epicondylitis is the most common overuse syndrome. It's estimated to have an annual incidence of 1-3% to of the population. And males and females are equally affected. And it's more likely to affect individuals over the age of 40. And in particular, we can often see the onset of this condition between the ages of 40 to 50. Let's talk about the pathophysiology as to why this condition occurs. The mechanism of action in lateral epicondylitis is due to overuse. We mentioned this in the risk factors. But more specifically, it is excessive wrist extension. So looking at this diagram here, if we have the wrist completely straightened out, and we were to bend it forward like this, this would be considered flexion. If we were to actually bring it back like this, this would be considered extension. So the primary problem in this condition is excessive wrist extension, so this motion here. Now we can see issues with flexion also increasing the risk of this condition as well, but extension is going to be more important. So we're going to see excessive wrist extension as the primary mechanism of injury here. So this is why we can see tennis and other racket sports causing this condition because you can think that if you're not keeping your wrist straightened or if you're bending it or extending it excessively, if you're doing backhand, for instance, and you're extending your wrist when you shouldn't be, this can increase the likelihood of having this condition. Now, although this condition is called lateral epicondylitis and epicondylitis means inflammation of the epicondyle, this condition actually does not involve inflammation of the lateral epicondyle. And when we actually look at the histology as to what might be happening, we see several different characteristic findings on histology. One of them is going to be disarray of the collagen. Another one is going to be angiofibroblastic degeneration. We can also see neurovascularization, so the formation of new blood vessels. And we can also see angiogenesis, which would be new blood vessels forming from previous blood vessels that have already been there. And then we can also see an increased number of fibroblasts in the area as well. Now what does seem to occur is that the tendon becomes hypovascular proximal to the point of insertion. So it becomes hypovascular meaning that there's not enough oxygen getting to that particular area of the tendon. So this hypovascularity induces hypoxic injury to the tendon which subsequently leads to degeneration and those histological abnormalities we talked about before. So if we were to actually look at the muscles of the forearm, so this would be the posterior forearm, the muscles and the tendons that are going to be affected are the extensor carpi radialis brevis. So you can see here the extensor carpi radialis brevis. So if we were to actually trace this muscle back to where it inserts on the humerus, it inserts at the humeral lateral epicondyle. And this is where we're going to see some hypovascularity occurring and we're going to often especially see this occurring one to two centimeters distal to attachment to the lateral epicondyle. So one to two centimeters away from the lateral epicondyle is where we're going to see the most issues here. And there are some other muscles that have also been proposed to be affected as well and these include the extensor carpi ulnaris. So this is the muscle here you can see it extends back toward the lateral epicondyle and then the extensor digitorum which also leads back to the lateral epicondyle through the common extensor tendon. So these are the muscles that can often be affected in this condition. So the main hallmark finding of this condition, lateral epicondylitis, is a lateral elbow pain. So this lateral elbow pain will most often occur within 
24 to 72 hours after activity involving excessive wrist extension. So again, this can come from improper backhand and racket sports. In some cases, we can see an insidious onset, so it may not be an abrupt onset. It may be very slow. Over time, we may see this increasing severity of pain. With regards to the pain, the pain will worsen with activity and will improve with rest. And there is some pain to palpation at the point where we talked about in the last slide, at that one to two centimeters distal to the attachment of the extensor carpi radialis brevis muscle on the lateral epicondyle. So it's one to two centimeters distal to that attachment site. And then pain may radiate down the posterior forearm as well. So along with it being at the lateral epicondyle, we can see it going down the posterior forearm as well. Now there are particular activities I want to mention here that can elicit this pain. Again, some of these are going to include backhand and racket sports. Another one is going to be turning a doorknob. So whichever arm may be affected, if you're playing racket sports with your right arm, for instance, and you use that arm to turn a doorknob, you can actually elicit this pain as well. You're utilizing those muscles that are affected. Also turning a screwdriver. So especially with excessive screwdriver use, we can see lateral elbow pain as well. And in some severe cases, even holding a cup can elicit pain in the lateral elbow. So this can often be noted as coffee cup sign. So this is going to be elicited in more severe cases. And again, it all has to do with that excessive wrist extension. So again, you can imagine backhand sports. If you're flicking your wrist, if you're extending it excessively, this can increase the likelihood of this condition. Turning a doorknob involves wrist extension. Screwdriver use, also wrist extension, as you can see in this image here. And then holding a coffee cup can also be as well. So all of these can be triggered by that wrist extension. So how do clinicians diagnose and treat epicondylitis? So lateral epicondylitis is going to be a clinical diagnosis. We can use several different clinical tests, including Cozen's test, which is a resisted wrist extension test. So you hold the patient's arm and you push against their wrist when they're trying to extend their wrist. And this is going to be a positive sign if it causes pain in the lateral elbow at the lateral epicondyle. And then the chair test is also another potential way of testing this condition. And what we do here is that we can get the patient to actually try to pick up a chair using three fingers, their thumb, their index finger, and their middle finger. They try to pick it up and that elicits pain in the lateral epicondyle. That is also another positive test. And then Mills test is another clinical test. If you want more information, please look up this test. Now, most cases are going to be diagnosed clinically, but in some cases, imaging may be required. So a plain radiography may be used, so an x-ray and a CT scan in some cases. This is often going to be most used in refractory cases. So if the patient doesn't respond to treatment, imaging can be utilized. And this is going to be used to rule out other conditions. So looking for osteophytes or osteoarthritis or fractures, for instance. Some newer modalities for assessing the tendon include musculoskeletal ultrasonography. Now, how do clinicians treat this condition? This is going to be often a self-limiting condition, so a watch and wait approach is going to be most often used. So supportive treatments are going to be the hallmark here. And this condition can take a while to resolve. It can take up to 9 to 18 months for resolution. Now, there are a large list of other possible treatments, including non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so ibuprofen, Motrin, those types of medications can help reduce the pain. Corticosteroid injection may be used in some cases. Local anesthetics can be used. Acupuncture has been also noted to be beneficial in reducing pain. Bracing the arm, botulinum toxin injections, laser therapy, extracorporeal shockwave therapy, and others. So many different treatments can be used to help reduce the pain, but oftentimes what's going to be required is rest and alterations in the way that the patient or athlete may actually play those racket sports. So improving their technique, improving the equipment they're using, those types of changes can help as well. And besides all of those other possible treatments, if none of them have worked, then surgery may be used in those refractory cases. I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.